Next, we have um, our next speaker is Dr. Amar Tareen. Um, Dr. Tareen was trained as a non-equilibrium statistical physicist during his PhD at Clark University in Massachusetts. Uh, subsequently, he did further training as a quantitative uh, biologist uh, working on the interface of massively parallel assays and machine learning methods at the Cold Spring Harbor Lab. Uh, in addition to uh, computational science, Dr. Turin really enjoys playing and performing music, both guitar and vocals, and also enjoys playing tennis and DIY woodworking projects. So with that, I'll hand the floor uh, over to Dr. Turin, and you can begin. Um, thank you very much, Megan, for that kind introduction. I think that was a lot of information, and I shouldn't have put all that information, but uh, uh, nonetheless, thank you very much for having me, Kwan, and organizing this. I'm very excited to be here. Um, uh, I think the, the choice of speakers was really appropriate because our work really gels well together. Um, but nonetheless, uh, so I've uh, hopefully you can see my screen and pointer. I'm a senior scientist at Regeneron, um, but a lot of this work was done at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, where I was a postdoc for four years in Justin Kinney's lab. And I'm fortunate enough to be able to continue this work at my new workplace. But I've developed a set of computational methods and an associated software package that infers quantitative models of genotype phenotype maps from data sets produced by multiplex assays of varying effects using a variety of inference algorithms, all in uh, one unified framework that I call um, MAVNN. So my plan is to begin with an introduction to multiplex assays of variant effect, or MAVES, uh, and go over the framework that I've developed on how to infer quantitative models of genotype phenotype maps from data produced by these experiments and jump into results. Although I think Maria has done quite a nice introduction for me already. <laughs> MAVES are a set of highly diverse experimental methods which can infer molecular, uh, which can measure molecular phenotypes or activity for thousands to millions of variant sequences in parallel, basically thanks to ultra high throughput sequencing methods. Um, I've listed some popular MAVE methods to showcase this diversity, including uh, deep mutational scanning, as we were just hearing, RNA-seq and sort-seq MPRAs. Um, and I should mention that when I say phenotype, I mean like a molecular phenotype, like Gibbs free energy of binding and not something like, uh, or, or gene expression, but not something like human height. And uh, underlying all MAVEs is the idea that they want to probe these genotype phenotype maps in great detail. Uh, today, I'll be focusing on these three types of MAVEs shown in the box. There is an emerging community of scientists that are interested in developing MAVE technologies. Perhaps I don't need to mention it because Maria did such a great introduction. But what I'm showing here is a resource called MAVEDB, which is a public repository of data sets from MAVEs generated from many different universities and labs. And additionally, I also have a screenshot from CMAP, the Center for Multiplex um, Assessment of Phenotype, based in the University of Washington and Toronto, and uh, who are also uh, interested in developing uh, MAVEs and MAVE-related science. These experiments produ uh, produce large data sets, which enable rich quantitative modeling of genotype phenotype maps. However, there are key gaps that uh, are still present in modeling methodologies. For example, MAVEs are um, often distorted by strong nonlinearities and experimental noise, and distinguishing interesting biological properties from these confounding factors isn't always straightforward. And most computational methods focus on accurately quantifying uh, sequence activities, um, individual sequence activities, uh, which is an approach that cannot quantify activity in vastly large regions of sequence space that one may be interested in. Okay, so but we can address these gaps in modeling methodologies, though. We can determine mathematical functions, which can accurately predict the activity of any sequence, regardless of whether they were assayed in a lab, we can develop appropriate inference algorithms that can remove confounding effects of these nonlinearities and uh, experimental noise from the biology that we care about. Um, and while we're at it, we can develop uh, models with biologically interpretable parameters. Uh, 
So with that prefaced, the question that I would like to address in this talk today is the following. We have a diverse set of MAVEs that produced large data sets uh, and probe genotype phenotype maps in great detail. How do we quantitatively model these data? And my answer to this is MAVE-NN, which is a set of computational methods that can infer quantitative models of genotype phenotype maps from MAVE data using global epistasis regression and measurement process agnostic regression in a unified framework. I should mention that MavenN exists as a software package, which in addition to software tutorials, demos, uh, documentation, tests, has a web page which also lists all the equations that I used in the quantitative modeling. And I've used my years of experience as a software developer in, a, in the greater Boston area to not only comprehensively document it and test it, but so to set it up so that anyone can apply and adopt this package to their biological question. All you have to do is pip install Maven and you're ready to go. Before I get into the Maven and N modeling strategy, I wanted to take a couple of slides and talk about the experimental structure of Maves and the format of the resulting data because I think it's useful to note that many MAVE experiments share a, a similar structure. In general, a library of sequences containing mutations relative to wild type serve as input to an experiment. This experiment that output these sequences into one or more bins that uh, depends on each sequence's measured molecular phenotype. And these sequences in each bin are then tallied through high throughput DNA sequencing. The resulting data sets often come in two formats. One is a uh, sequence and counts in bins, and these are counts directly from your sequencer. And, uh, uh, and the second is a real number for each sequence. And uh, I've shown, uh, I'm showing an example of both of these uh, types of data in, in here. So now that we've briefly seen uh, uh, MAVES and their data, I will introduce at a high level the strategy that we use in MAVE and to infer quantitative models from these data and then get into examples. At the core of MAVE and N's modeling strategy is the conceptualization of genotype phenotype maps as a type of information compression, where MAVE and N assumes that in an experiment, the GP map first compresses an input sequence into a single meaningful scalar that we call the latent phenotype. And this quantity is only read out indirectly by a noisy measurement process. And the idea is that explicitly modeling this noisy measurement process, along with the biologically meaningful GP map or genotype phenotype map, Maven is able to remove potentially confounding effects of noise and nonlinearities from these biological GP maps. And during training, Maven infers quantitative models, both for uh, phi and P of Y given phi. And an operational detail is that Maven models are implemented and trained as neural networks that um, uh, interface with a TensorFlow 2 backend. So in the case of sequence counts data, the inference algorithm that we use is called measurement process agnostic regression or MPA regression, where Maven, uh, models the stochastic measurement process P of Y given phi directly and simultaneously learns the biologically relevant deterministic mapping from sequence to the latent variable. I'm showing an example sort seq data set in which counts are generated by the luminescence of a fluorescent reporter protein. And the inferred measurement process by Maven is shown here. You, as you go up on the y-axis, the higher numbers are supposed to reflect um, higher fluorescence of these sorted sequences, and the x-axis is the inferred phenotype, and uh, it's strongly correlated with the higher fluorescers. So in the case of sequence and real-valued measurements, Maven assumes that each sequence is mapped on to a latent phenotype by a deterministic GP map, which is then mapped on to an observable y-hat by a nonlinear function, which is finally read out to your measurement by a stochastic noise model, P of Y given Y hat. We call this one global epistasis regression. 
So I'd like to show you uh, an example of the inferred nonlinearity from for sequence real valued measurements here. These data are from a GB1 enrichment experiment that I will talk about shortly. And the panels on the right uh, show the nonlinearity, uh, uh, which maps from the measurements to the latent inferred phenotype, where the value of y hat is the nonlinear function shown by this uh, dark green line. And the shaded areas are the confidence intervals of the noise model. Maven N uh, supports four uh, forms of GP map, an additive GP map, where each position in the sequence contributes independently and additively to the latent phenotype, a neighbor uh, GP map, which accounts for potential epistatic interactions between neighboring positions, a fully pairwise model, which includes uh, interactions between all pairs of positions, regardless of their distance, and a black box a machine a NLP GP map, which could uh, infer uh, potentially higher order features. Finally, there's also the ability to uh, um, input custom GP maps, such as thermodynamic or kinetic models. And just uh, a bit of uh, model training metrics. The way we assess model performance is through three information theoretic quantities shown on this diagram. So intrinsic information represents the mutual information between the sequences X and the measurement Y, and it's inherent to a data set. There's no modeling done here. Predictive information quantifies the mutual information between the measurements and the latent phenotype Y, which is assigned by a model. And finally, variational information is a lower bound on the predictive information, and we compute this rapidly during training. And on test data, we uh, these uh, metrics um, obey this inequality, where intrinsic information is strictly greater than, which is greater than equal to predictive information, which is greater than equal to variational information. Okay, so with the modeling strategy defined, we're ready to dive into some uh, into some of the results of the analyses uh, of some MAVs that I've done using MAVEN, -N, and we'll start by global epistasis regression. Uh, I want to begin with an example of a DMS assay of protein G uh, and then show the resulting global epistasis regression that I did. Uh, deep mutational scanning is an experimental technique in which the molecular phenotype for variant protein sequences is measured. So in this example, protein G, uh, which is an immunoglobulin binding protein expressed in streptococcal bacteria, um, was uh, its DNA sequence was mutagenized to produce these variant proteins. And the authors of this assay wanted to quantify the binding affinity of G these GB1 variants for their, uh, for their binding sites, which happened to be these beads. So they first created this library of protein coding sequences, um, which produce variants of protein G showed by these belts. And they quantified the affinity of their, um, these uh, variants for their Ig binding sites by using uh, mRNA display, which is a technique in which the encoding RNAs showed by these wavy lines are covalently linked to their proteins. They then deep sequenced these mRNA to tally which proteins were bound versus not bound. From the ratio of recounts of sequences in the selected library versus the input library, they're able to compute this quantity called log enrichment, which they report as their measurement. And it's from these data that we want to infer a GP map for the binding energy of GB1 as a function of sequence. However, there's good reason to a priori suspect a nonlinear relationship between binding energy and log enrichment, which is the quantity that they've measured. So imagine in the simplest case, we can imagine that the Gibbs free energy of a protein G variant bound to its target is an additive function of sequence, reflecting no neighbor or pairwise epistasis. Even if the enrichment of variants is performed under equilibrium thermodynamic conditions, enrichment values re re reflect the equilibrium occupancy of each protein G variant, which is a nonlinear uh, function of the binding energy. It kind of looks like this. Note that free energies are related to, these free energies, delta Gs, are related to dissociation constants via this simple relationship, where R is the gas constant and T is the temperature and so on. So delta Gs are just an, a, a slightly different way of thinking about these 
When I fit a global epistasis regression model to these data with an additive GP map, I clearly see a nonlinear relationship between the measurements on the y-axis versus the inferred latent phenotype. And if I then plot the predictions of my GE models against test sequences, which are sequences not observed during training, I get quite a nice R squared of 0.937 along with a noise model. Having accounted for this nonlinear mapping, I can now look at the parameters of the underlying GP map, which indicates mutational effects. So colors indicate the additive effects for uh, each amino acid residue at each of the 55 positions of protein GB1 that were mutagenized. The effect of all wild type residues are shown by this gray dots. And so the, the red colors are deleterious mutations and the greens are, are beneficial to binding mutations. And note that this proline has the streak of deleterious mutations, which gives me some confidence that, okay, this is perhaps a reasonable model. But nonetheless, this is a phenomenological model, meaning that the mutational effects have arbitrary units. To remedy this issue, we have to be able to make uh, predictions of mutational effects in meaningful energy units like KBT or kcal per, per mole. To this end, I trained a new global epistasis regression model where I uh, coded in a GP map as a thermodynamic model for protein folding and protein uh, and binding for GP1, where the aim is to separate out the mutational effects that we learn from the additive model into binding and folding energies as a function of sequence in meaningful energy units. Briefly, a thermodynamic model assumes that protein states, and these are microstates as they are called in thermodynamic equilibrium, um, the, uh, uh, microstates reach thermodynamic e equilibrium very quickly and Boltzmann distribution relate the probability of that state with the free energy of that state. So that equation is shown here where the denominator is a partition function, the probability of all states and the numerator is the, the state where protein GB1 is folded and bound. So then I sought to fit a simple three-state thermodynamic uh, model with a global epistasis uh, regression to these data. And what I found is, is this. And I'm able to infer energy matrices, both for binding and folding, and a mapping between measurements and uh, the latent phenotype phi and also a slightly better R squared on test. It goes from 0 0.9, 0 0.937 to 0.95. And now note that the nonlinear relationship between the latent phenotype and the measurement is almost linear, which tells me that this is a reasonable choice of model. And, and to bring this analysis to a close, I can now make predictions for folding energies in delta delta G in, in kcal per mole for the sequences whose folding energies were individually measured in this publication by, uh, by Nishtal in 2018. Uh, sorry, this is a PNAS, I should have put a reference here. And the, the blind predictions on these test sequences are, are quite good. So these are uh, delta delta G folding energies measured in lab that Maven is predicting quite well. So, Another example I want to discuss is a massively parallel splicing assay, which aims to understand splicing activity as a function of human five prime splice sites. Pre-mRNA splicing is a process in which introns are excised from mRNA transcripts, and the remaining exons are ligated together, uh, and this forms a key step in the expression of human genes. And biologically, it's quite important to understand this since mutations in spike sites can often lead to diseases like uh, cancer or spinal muscular atrophy. And in order to quantify how mutations might affect splicing, my former colleague Mandy Wong at CSHL created a three mini gene exon library consisting of exons 16, 17, and 18 of the human BRCA2 gene, where the five prime splice site of exon 17 was replaced by a randomized nine nucleotide sequence. Uh, these library, this library was then transfected into HeLa cells where uh, splicing could occur, and then bulk RNA was extracted, which included sequences that either contained exon 17 or didn't contain exon 17, so misspliced. And the resulting data set is shown in this table where the percent spliced in value was reported as their measurement in this paper. 
And from these data, we want to be able to model uh, PSI, percent spliced in, as a function of uh, five prime splice site sequence. If I now repeat a global epistasis regression, similar to GB1, but this time include a GP map, a genotype phenotype map that doesn't only have uh, additive and independent features, but also pairwise features, which account for pairwise epistasis between neighboring and farther away positions in a sequence, I get a heat map that shows mutational effects like this for pairwise mutations and like this for additive mutations. So you can clearly see that you can't mutate the G out here. And there's a corresponding nonlinearity that maps the latent pairwise phenotype to these measurements shown here, along with the form of the noise model that we use, which is a um, mathematically interesting model. It's a skewed uh, and highly asymmetric model, but collapses to a Gaussian or a Cauchy distribution uh, when, the, uh, when the right type of data are present. Uh, so this plot shows the performance of the various model quantified by predictive information in orange and variational information in blue when I use higher and higher complexity genotype phenotype maps. The gray box shows the lower bound of the inherent information or intrinsic information found in the data set. And only when I get to a black box GP map does it get to the lower bound of that information. So even a pairwise model doesn't capture the full variance in the data sets. So there's probably something really crazy going on in 3D space in the way that this model governs splicing. So this analysis highlights that pairwise interaction models are not sufficient to describe five prime splice set sequences that govern alternate, alternative mRNA splicing and higher order epistatic interactions are needed to describe this critical aspect of eukaryotic biology. And uh, this is the last section. And since I only have a minute or two, I'll, I'll sort of breeze through it. But basically, uh, this describes measurement process agnostic regression, which measures, which models the, the measurement process directly rather than through a specific nonlinearity. And the, the type of assay is similar in structure to the assays before, where a library is mutagenized, which drives the expression of a fluorescent reporter which are then put into bacterial cells, which are then uh, fact sorted by their luminescence and which are, whose sequences are then extracted and put into various bins. And as a reminder, these are the type of data that that produces. So the schematic of the proteins involved and their associated, associated energies is shown here, which is RNA polymerase binding to the promoter sequence with the Delta G a transcription factor CRP binding to DNA with its uh, delta uh, with its uh, binding energy delta GC and an interaction between these proteins. You can write down this entire system as a thermodynamic model with states shown here and a Boltzmann distribution for latent phenotype shown here. This is slightly more complicated version of the GB1, but what you're able to do after you fit a measurement process agnostic model is you're able to measure these delta delta Gs of binding for the transcription factor and the RNA polymerase, and also their uh, interaction energy in meaningful units, which you can then independently validate along with the measurement uh, process. So here's the outlook of my seminar, which is that MAVEN is a package that can infer quantitative models of sequence function relationships or genotype phenotype maps from MAVE data using global epistasis regression and measurement process agnostic regression. I should mention that I'm currently working on uh, MAVEN2, which I'm calling flexible quantitative modeling for multiplex assays of variant effect. And it really fleshes out quite a lot of the, the things that MAVEN1 can do, including replicate measurements and specific measurement processes and multiple phenotypes and so on. I'd really like to thank my uh, colleagues and collaborators, including my PI at Cold Spring Harbor Lab. Um, and uh, I'd uh, also like to thank my current family at Regeneron, who uh, I'm fortunate enough to have worked with me on this project. I apologize for going a little bit over time, but I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Tureen. Uh, fantastic talk. Um, and yeah, like Dr. Tween said, uh, if you have any questions, you can ask them um, or type them into the chat.
I'm probably still sharing screen. I don't know how to turn it off. But here, I'll uh, I'll leave oh, yeah. share on so that if there's any questions. Uh, Quan, he has a question. Sure. Um, great talk, Amar. Um, so, so very interesting, actually, the comparison between the neighbor and the diff. And uh, it mm -hmm. seems like going from neighbor to pairwise doesn't help that much. That's that's right. Very good observation. So neighbor epistasis. So this this small the smallness of this jump probably tells me that just taking into account neighboring interactions already does quite a lot for the variance, explaining the variance in the data. And uh, uh, like if you have an adenine here and a guanine all the way out here, it, if you've already taken into account the neighbors, this is adding not too much variance. Although it's nice to see that it, the trend is going forward. In Maven 2, I'm showing that um, you, you need, I fit third and fourth order models to these, which now you can do just by prescribing a parameter. And third order models are all you need to, to explain this variance. And so in here, we found a model which explains the variance, but it's completely uninterpretable. So it's a three layer dense neural network. Uh, but it, 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 for, uh, for, but we, so you don't need like fourth order models. So there's something crazy probably happening in like sequence and 3D space. But yeah, good, good observation. Um, I, I think in the forthcoming paper, I'll talk a little bit more about this. And uh, but yeah, already the pairwise model is, is saying that most of the sequences that are important for splicing are pretty garbage. And then it's finding some of these sequences that are good for splicing. Mm. Yeah. Very interesting. Thanks. Looking forward to that paper.